welcome to uh, this LSE public lecture hosted by the Department of Sociology. Tonight's speaker is uh, Paul Mason, who will be known to many of you as BBC Newsnight's economics editor and as Paul Mason News, an influential tweeter and blogger. While I'm on that topic, I've been asked to let you know that the Twitter hashtag for tonight's event is LSE Revolt. There will, incidentally, also be a reception just outside the lecture theater as soon as the lecture is finished, uh, where you will also be able to buy copies of Paul's book. In its review of his earlier meltdown book, The Telegraph called Paul Newsnight's macabre but watchable economics editor. I think he's rather more than that. <laughs> Uh, in his 20s, uh, Paul was a musician. He played the trombone and a musicologist, writing the music for a play about the miners' strike with the sun on our backs in 1985. He was also a teacher and deputy editor of Computer Weekly before joining the BBC in 2001. Paul has also recently published some fiction, Rare Earth, a zeitgeist novel about the growing dominance of the Chinese economy. It's about, and I'm quoting, the West's inability to understand the East, one man's epic journey across the dying landscape where thousands of pairs of eyes peer beyond grimy window panes into the motionless sky looking for something better. That's a theme which resonates with his work as an economics journalist and writer on social history. His first book, Live, Working or Die Fighting, How the Working Class Went Global from 2007, is a history of working class movements from the early 19th century to the start of World War II. His second book, Meltdown, The End of the Age of Greed, published in 2009, provides a frontline account of the credit crunch and its immediate aftermath. Paul's latest book, why It's Kicking Off Everywhere, The New Global Revolutions, published just this month, takes its title from the blog he wrote almost exactly one year ago for the BBC. At the heart of it all, he writes in the blog on uh, entry one, is a new sociological type, the graduate with no future, with access to social media so they can express themselves in a variety of situations ranging from parliamentary democracy to tyranny, Horizontalism has become endemic because technology makes it easy. It kills vertical hierarchies spontaneously. Right on cue, the blog went viral. It was shared nearly 12,000 times. The book elaborates on this thesis, taking in protests from London to Egypt through Tunisia, Iran, Madrid and Greece, searching for economic, social, political and above all technological linkages between them. Paul argues that we have been witnessing a series of revolutions caused by the near collapse of free market capitalism combined with technical innovation, social media, that has underpinned a profound change in the human consciousness of freedom. In a recent interview with The Guardian, Paul said, the through line of my reporting is about social justice. What I'm trying to do is get to the detail, the gritty, granular, uncomfortable, detailed reality of what social justice means. And with that underlying message, I hand you over to Paul Mason. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm just going to struggle for two seconds with my own technology here uh, until it goes um, right. Um, I'm always extremely privilege to be uh, speaking at the LSE and uh, hopefully because it's quite hot in here you can stick with me for another uh, hour and a half or however long it is um, and let, let me just try this because the mouse is broken yeah, there we go that's a good okay <clears throat> Ben Ali was overthrown Mubarak was overthrown and put on trial Gaddafi was overthrown and executed. Kevin Spacey was none of the above, but he did put on at the Old Vic Theatre last summer a production of Richard III where he channeled the experience of the Arab Spring into a riveting portrayal of a lost dictator. 
Though Spacey's Richard III drew on something new, it was a reminder that this process is not itself new. The overthrow of a power elite, uh, the collapse of dictatorships flailing to the soundtrack of verbose, egotistical rubbish, surrounded by courtiers prepared until the very last to sing their praises or, as in the case of today, to write to the Financial Times pleading with the international community to save Gamal Mubarak as the only representative of free market capitalism available to the West. You can look up for yourself in my book who wrote that. There is so much of the old overlaying these revolutionary times that it's tempting and entirely rational to grab hold of it, to think maybe if we just start reporting the Arab Spring as a subset of that old issue, Islam or the Middle East crisis, then what is new in it might go away. Maybe if we see Occupy Wall Street as, and ask, well, well, what does this mean, this thing here? What does that mean for Obama? And what does that mean for Obama's poll rating? Uh, maybe if we do that, then the movement can just be slotted back in to the narrative of the old of congressional politics. But for me, the most pressing question is not what is old or familiar in the present situation, but what is new. In the torture cells of post-Gaddafi Libya, in the anarchist collectives of rural France, in a riot in Syntagma Square, Athens, you will meet every character from Shakespeare. The question is, why are they now arrayed in the wrong order? Why are the weak now powerful? Why do the gravediggers and the innkeepers sound like philosophers while the kings and princes sound like fools? That is the question. And to answer it is to begin to understand, as I have tried to understand, why it is kicking off everywhere. To non-English non speakers or people to whom English is a new culture. This phrase kicking off is colloquial for what happens if you walk into the wrong pub in Scotland <laughs> and mention that a certain regiment's square broke at Waterloo 200 years ago. Don't try it. But that's what kicking off is. It's the greatest system, it's the greatest economic system ever invented. It has pulled millions out of poverty. It has produced a technical revolution, technological revolution so that its cities are dominated now by unfeasibly tall architectural spears aimed direct 90 degrees into the sky. Though it is constantly embroiled in wars, it's the most advanced economic system on earth. Nothing better than it can be imagined. The year is 1345. The system is known as feudalism. Edward III is about to go bust, taking down with him the Italian bankers who've lent him the money. So Edward does a uh, debtor-led default, as we call it today, and English feudalism survives for another 150 years. But Italian feudalism does not. Says one contemporary account, in Italy, once the Bardis and Peruzzi family had gone bust, only the outsiders to the system, the barely acknowledged and barely tolerated economic players, survived. Quotes, only usurers and craftsmen have cash in hand once the banking system's gone. So in that moment, and out of many moments like it, out of the crisis of feudalism, capitalism is born. Now, we have the crisis of capitalism. This very phrase, capitalism in crisis, I remember in the 1970s being run in 36-point type on the headlines of left-wing newspapers. Now, it's running in 84-point type on the front page of the Financial Times. It's clearly more than cyclical. It is a structural crisis. It's the crisis of a model, if you want, a regime of accumulation, if you like that methodology, of an epoch, 
It's a crisis of something that's lasted several decades. Now, to those who fear that by naming this as a structural crisis, we are in some way being anti-capitalist or leftist, I think you underestimate the resilience of the system itself. Capitalism's history exhibits long waves, which both Schumpeter and, above all, Kondratiev tried to observe, to theorise, to describe. Usually, a long 50-year wave ending, writes Kondratiev, uh, with a slump and a social crisis, which then prepares the way for the rapid deployment of new epoch-defining technologies for the next long wave. Out of the crisis then, says Kondratiev, comes a new form of capitalism. Sometimes it looks so unlike the old form that its critics refuse to acknowledge it. It is even ooh, the same thing. <laughs> so we have a model for understanding structural crises that are not and I don't attempt to suggest this in the book, the final crisis of capitalism, but they are structural. However, any severe crisis in a system also raises the 1345 Edward III question. Maybe there comes a time in the long-wave cyclical life of an economic system when the change is so great and so pervasive and so global that you really are looking at maybe a 500-year moment and not a 50-year moment. Now, Rupert Murdoch last year made a speech to, um, made a lecture, um, actually late 2010, where he said um, the Lehman crisis basically is just a business cycle. In fact, that, that's um, something that the American embassy took me aside and said just after Lehman. They said, this is just a blip. America's still going to be number one. I remember them saying that. Um, now, I, the reason I'm standing here, and I hope the reason why you're sitting in the audience, is because there are bigger issues at stake than that. I think, of course, it's the end of a business cycle. Of course, the Lehman Brothers was... Th those of you who studied the economics of pre-Lehman, you were already seeing cyclical downturn, um, falling stock market prices long before Lehman. But, you know, this is easily fittable into a Kondratiev or a 50-year or a structural uh, understanding of the crisis. But I think the audacious thing to ask is, is this a, not is this a business cycle, is, is it 50 years or is it a 500 year issue we're looking at? And I will give, towards the end of this talk, my provisional answer to that. What is clear at the start is that a model of accumulation is failing. Marketization, globalization, financialization have combined to produce a model in the West based on consumption driven growth while depressing for 20 years the real wages of the majority of workers, the median wages of the workers, rather. And the, the gap between consumption-driven growth and stagnation at the level of incomes is driven by what? Credit. And the source of the credit is the trade surpluses and the savings mountains and the foreign exchange mountains of the producing countries. Even if you acknowledge, as I do, that... There was a, this is an inverted commas, quasi-heroic phase to neoliberalism in the sense as in ancient Greece when the rising trade, rising technological innovation and access to finance did create what we now see as the Goldilocks era when it was neither too hot nor too cold and inflation targeting allowed um, stable economic management techniques to be deployed. If you accept that, it's now clear that since probably 1999, the same factors that drove stability are creating instability. A perpetual cycle since 2000 of boom and bust, asset price inflation, during which the only constant is that in every bust, the financial elite is not harmed. And in this latest bust, the financial elite seems to have been able to get richer while the middle class of several developed countries is in the process of being completely squeezed, and in America's case, they would argue even, Ari Ariana Huffington says, disappearing. And in its latest phase, as we've seen in Europe, democracy becomes less and less able to manage the economy. From a deflationary role in the world, the entry of China turns inflationary. The euro, instead of being a pillar of stability, becomes an unexploding bomb, scaring the world 
as President Obama puts it. The global finance system, whose complexity was embraced on the grounds that complexity equals liquidity equals stability, now creates instability. It can't adequately allocate capital at all. America, which thought by promoting globalization it would promote its own interests, now finds itself scoured out economically, demographically, emotionally by globalization. The massive debt accumulated to finance the era of stability will now hang over a long period of prolonged instability. And this does not require a degree in capital volumes one, two, and three to believe, because it is something that people like Christine Lagarde are only too clear about. Our sense, writes Lagarde, says Lagarde, is that we don't act boldly, and if we don't act together, the economy around the world runs the, ri the risk of downward spiral of uncertainty, financial instability, and potential collapse of global demand. We're looking, she says, at a potential 10-year stagnation. But I think we can discuss the economics another time. What's clear is that the collapse of banking had an immediate political and social impact and an ideological impact. It dented the prestige of high finance and disorientated the power elite. Suddenly, the old doctrine uh, attributed to Karl Rove, uh, you might have heard this phrase, the reality-based community. Rove said that, look, we the elite in the new situation of history uh, in 2003, we, we create reality and you... Uh, the plebeian masses, the, the, the observers, the journalists, you are in the reality-based community because we create your reality. And while you study it assiduously, as you may, says Rove, we could create another reality. It's the ultimate Nietzschean viewpoint of a power elite that believed it was not challengeable. And of course, starting from Lehman Brothers, they lose control of almost everything. They fail to be able to, to win elections, they lose the White House, they see the, the finance system collapse, wars become that were seen as winnable, don't look winnable, and the ideology spirals out of control. Greenspan makes his famous admission, I found a flaw. <laughs> Another thing that then disappears, as we will find, is the notion of durable authoritarianism. That there was a kind of authoritarianism probably modelled on China that was transferable to a lot of other places where as long as you carried on delivering something that looked like top-line GDP growth, something that looked like uh, the dragging, certainly as far as Mubarak was concerned, the official figures told the UN that every year Mubarak had dragged more and more people out of official poverty. Um, as long as you carry on doing that authoritarianism, you will keep getting the 99.9% .9 uh, in every referendum that Mubarak subjected himself to. I think that was the significance of the Lehman moment, the ideological change. But once we had decided to bankrupt countries instead of banks, the stage was set for something more than ideological because a whole generation of young people across the world then realised that all the promises made during the period of stability, the 2000s, were not deliverable. The life curve promised was study, work hard, be entrepreneurial, become high skill, you'll get a pension, you'll have a rising income, you'll, have a, you'll get onto the escalator of asset price inflation at a certain level, your house, your shares will rise in value, um, you'll have access to credit, and where it goes wrong or in later life, there'll be a welfare state in Europe or in the USA, there'll be affordable private medical insurance to look after you. Okay. Many people, it doesn't have to be that it all goes wrong, that it all goes wrong for every single one of you who's under the age of 35 in this room. But what has already gone wrong in, in many people's minds is the model. They can't see themselves. They can't, there's a whole, all that list I've just said, there's a whole tick box that is kind of not filled in anymore. And people can see the opposite. And to some people, as we know, countries like Spain, Close to 50% of young people now unemployed. You saw that feature in The Guardian, very well worth looking at, of young professionals um, doing nothing. A generation now. And we know that today's EU summit, that's high on their agenda. Very interesting to see what they come out with. 
But I think this realization did produce an identity crisis for a generation. You could see it. When I went back to look at this, I hadn't noticed this at the time. I went back to look at some of the early student manifestos of the movement that I, if you've already got the book or are reading it, what I describe is actually the movement starts not long after Lehman. There is, a, there is a beginnings of some social unrest in Greece in December 2008, and then in the student of, uh, movements in France to, uh, and, and above all the USA, 2009. And I went back and looked at some of the things they'd written, and there is this one thing, the, um, the uh, communique from an absent future, written by students at University of California, Santa Cruz, during their occupation. And there it is. Uh, Work hard, play hard has been the over-eager motto of a generation in training for what? Drawing hearts in cappuccino foam or plugging names and numbers into databases. Um, a university diploma, they write, is now worth no more than a share in General Motors. At this point, General Motors has gone bust. We work and we borrow in order to work and borrow. And the jobs we work toward are the jobs we already have. Now, even if that not, is not true for every one of you, and I certainly hope it is not, it is the ideological change that takes place among the generation. I have sat, before I started writing this book, I, as you said, I'd written a book about the economic crisis and explored some of these themes, and I got kind of sick of seeing n hundreds of nodding heads when I say what I've just said in student campuses. People go, ah, yes, you're describing what I'm thinking. So now you are the su studied subject of of sociology for a bit, uh, the graduate without a future. I don't want to depress you, you have a future, but it feels like some, to many people uh, a dislocation. And what it did, you see, it created a dislocation, I think I would argue, a dislocation in the loyalty to the old narrative of work hard, play hard. And whilst the hardest hit people, I think, have been in Southern Europe and the USA, and we saw it in 2010 in the UK with the student protests, don't think that this narrative is not transferable or is not transferred to the intelligentsia and the student population of the developing world. Uh, you will know that uh, the American University of Cairo is the dead center of Egyptian revolutionary activity. And when one goes to the AUC campus, you find people very much like people who are on the LSE campus with very similar ideas, training, background, reading, aspirations. So don't think that in some people, like, oh, people are always tweeting, Mason compares student revolt in Britain to glorious Arab Spring. How outrageous. Just meet a few of the people who organized the Arab Spring. It's not so outrageous, although I do not, what, by comparing, I do not equate them. Okay. We'll see where the differences are. So I argue the revolution that is underway. You know, anybody who's had any contact with Turkish culture will know that the word revolution means something very general in Turkey. There can be a hairstyle revolution in Turkey. Or there's almost revolution in almost everything else. And it goes back to the Ataturk revolution where, where cultural revolutions were inbuilt to the model. And it's in that sense that I use the word revolution. Um, there is a cultural and behavioral and personality and ideological revolution going on, I think, in that generation. No. The significance of it is this. Of course, the urban poor, very important. You will see from my reporting and from the book that I place a lot of emphasis on the urban poor and slum dwellers as the newly organized, very cohesive, but highly educated masses who are playing a big role in a lot of these revolutions. Of course, the workers are also important, and we can maybe discuss this. But I think it did remind me of the famous quote from Taine, Taine, writing the history of the, of the Jacobin Revolution, wrote that, look, if you're worried about a repeat of France 1789, don't worry about the poor, worry about poor lawyers. Because in the empty lawyer's waiting room, writes Taine, in the freezing garret of the notary or the doctor, um, there's a Jacobin just waiting to spring out. He then writes, that's often quoted, he then writes, Go back to the thing. It's all there online on, in, in uh, the French, what's the French national website. He writes, what it takes to make this, these people into revolutionaries is that all the mouldy barriers of society crumble at once. And what he meant was religion, respect for law, respect for the monarchy, respect for conservative morality in social life. Um, and this is all too relevant as well as the analogy with the Jacobins. Because it wasn't the Lehman crisis that 
that drew down all the mouldy barriers in social life. It was indeed the 20-year boom time that preceded it, which was a heyday of social liberalism, individualism, postmodernist irony, when a whole generation stuck two white things in their ears and became engrossed in their own story. That is, I think, uh, prepared the way for where we are now. For a, for a generation that does indeed resemble tamed Jacobins in the freezing garret, the student house, or the uh, trainee accountant house, or the trainee doctor house, where everybody sleeps one to a room and there's no sitting room, and even the kitchen sometimes. Um, but in every one of these freezing garrets, there is now a laptop. Mohamed Bouazizi did not set himself on fire because of Facebook or Twitter. The slum dwellers of Cairo did not join hand in hand, Muslim and Christian, and march to Tahrir Square and stay there for days because of social media. To the Western media, the revolutions in North Africa did initially look like Facebook revolutions because, first, the middle class youth in Tahrir, often Western educated, looked and sounded like the youth at UC Santa Cruz. And because they had organised, if you read the accounts, using Facebook. And, of course, because uh, quite ordinary people uh, kept holding up signs like that. Um, of course, amongst, among Egyptian revolutionaries, it's very controversial, to, for, especially non-Egyptian, to suggest that these are social media revolutions. And I say in general, and I say in the book, they were not. They were a frightening descent into chaos for many of the poor people who were involved in those revolutions, uh, who have no means of escape back to California or to London and, and will never be remembered because they never had an internet account. And they form the majority, I think, of the Shaheed, of the martyrs of the revolution. Uh, they are, they are name, not nameless to the revolutionaries, but they, they, are, they are from the masses. Okay, So that is to respect them and not say in any way, I'm not suggesting in any way, that these were Facebook revolutions. But... If these were social and political and real, um, you know, actually, I'll say one other thing. In Syntagma Square, in the Indignado camps, also not particularly highly bothered about Facebook and Twitter, because, as I'll discuss, they have an analog version of Facebook and Twitter going on right outside the flap of their tent. Um, to say Facebook and Twitter caused the revolutions is like saying the printing press or the pamphlet caused the English Civil War. Especially if you could have gone in your time machine back to the English Revolution and gone to the levellers in Shoreditch and said, this is all because of the printing press. They would have turned around to you and said, no, 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 it's because of God. This is why we are doing it. Um, but as a journalist one ha and as a social scientist, one has to be an instant historian and look beyond the presented causes of the, that the people themselves present to you. If you read um, Ghanim's book, uh, Revolution 2.0, uh, you do see uh, a very good worked first-hand account of how social media played a role in overcoming censorship and propaganda and how it usually changed the dynamic of revolts once revolts begin. The book gives an account of what's changed. Ghanim is, I think he's speaking here this week, I think, I'm not sure which, where, but Ghanim is speaking here at the LSE quite soon. He's in London right now. He's on Newsnight tonight. So he's working in Dubai. He's a Google executive. He sees the pictures of the murdered youth, Khaled Saeed, uh, in Alexandria. He sits at his computer and he bursts into tears. He starts the Facebook page, We Are All Khaled Saeed. There's another page already called I Am Khaled Saeed, but there's all, so there's a bit of a debate. But it be, his page becomes a rallying point for the tens of thousands of Egyptian youth. And if you read how he did it, quite interesting about how individual he wanted to be, how non-hierarchical, how non-preachy, how, how he presented itself it as him and not we. Very interesting. We discussed this on the Andrew, Andrew Marr programme this morning, this morning. So the movement that emerges onto the streets, first around Khaled Saeed himself, in a form of silent protests in Alexandria, people facing the sea and reading out prayers... Um, and then in late January, as the movement morphs um, into the call out for the January 25th revolution, the movement has already begun to take key decisions online by assent, by discussion. 
is quite interesting. It emerges as a complex, resilient network of thousands of educated youth that the regime just cannot deal with. The regime realises that it's, that, that it's been trapped by an uncontrollable information loop. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, feeding into Al Jazeera. The state media suddenly looks stupid against Al Jazeera uh, Arabic. Um, and it, this neutralises the old techniques of control. Again, Ghanim's moving account of his own imprisonment for 11 days blindfolded and, and physically harassed and mentally tortured uh, by the secret police reveals weird stuff about what they didn't understand. So they ask him for his Facebook password, but not until several days later his email account password. Um, it, it's stuff that they just c cannot get their heads around. And so they switch off Twitter and Facebook on day one, but it goes massive without Twitter and Facebook. And I've been thinking, since I started out from talking about Kevin Spacey and uh, Richard III, what that scene might have looked like if Shakespeare had written it. Scene, Mubarak's presidential palace. Mubarak. So, chief, so Norfolk, Richmond, what, was the, what they call. So, Earl of Richmond. <laughs> How many of the people are still left in Tahrir Square? Earl of Richmond. Well, about a million, sire. <laughs> Why, when we have turned off Facebook and Twitter, uh, are they still there? And we have deployed the secret police. Well, sire, they are getting around our censorship methods by using a proxy server. <laughs> what is the name of this proxy server? Silence. Come on, out with it. What is the name of the server? Sire, it is called hidemyass.com <laughs> I've often imagined that scene because it does illustrate whether it happened or not the cultural dislocate between those regimes and the people who overthrew them it's, 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 it, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a massive cultural disconnect and I think I've written that the other thing that social media does in this context is it makes all propaganda quite flammable because actually you can be a social, you can be a spin doctor on social media and you can go on it and attempt to be a spin doctor but actually you have to participate in social media to be on it. You can't, what spin doctors tend to do, you'll know who they are, you, I follow some of them, they'll come out with their little snippet of, of, of propaganda that they try and insert into the Thing. Even advertisers, it was some, was it Rio Ferdinand who decided to advertise something? But everybody can tell. And so people round on them like white blood cells and they neutralize that within it which is not accurate. And if you, you the way then to, to avoid being neutralized or rounded upon is to only work on, in a closed social media, to have only a media, a set of followers who are your allies and friends. And you, you, ha you have to be in a closed world. Interesting thing as well, people in the elite, the financial and political elite, actually find it very difficult to be in social media full stop. Executives aren't allowed to tweet. Executives, are, politicians, they tweet, but who believes they do the tweeting? Senior politicians, okay? Even Tom Watson's um, what's his, what, uh, sort of um, intern turned out to be tweeting on his account. See, now this is important because if part of your reality is to be in social media, and then if you can't be in that reality, that's quite a big barrier if this is becoming a, not the, a venue for democratic discussion. So you have to be, you know, it, it's hard for the elite to use the social media, easy for the masses. And what does it do? I've got this as an example. I, won't sh I can't show you the YouTube clip. It's too technically advanced for me to do this. But the, I, you, I talk in the book about one example from the Iranian uprising. The Iranian uprising was the first of the revolts to be called a Twitter revolution, even though only 1,000 people had Twitter accounts in Iran in June 2009. Um, but look what happens. I don't know whether this is, you can see this. It's a still from YouTube. Um, and what's happening is that... Uh, the. The, the police had attacked a demo, and this is a bus stop full of bystanders, or maybe some of the demonstrators are trying to stand at the bus stop looking like bystanders. I, you can't really see it, but it, look it up on Twitter. You can see what it's called. I'm oh, sorry, on YouTube. That's the title. This woman here, that grey thing there, 
is her leg because she's karate kicking a, a riot policeman. She runs up in her hijab, she's about this high, and she karate kicks the riot cop. Then the two riot cops attack her. That's her there on the left of the frame, again in grey trousers, crunched down and there. And then, after they've hit her, they hit a car bonnet in frustration because they don't want to hit her, a small woman in a hijab. They, they, they don't want to be doing it. It's a great little vignette of, um, of what happened in Iran. And, and by the evening of every demonstration early in that those events, there were always um, videos like that in evidence. Now, as a amateur social historian, writing about, as I've done, the Paris Commune, uh, the Jewish Bund in Poland, um, between, world, in, between the wars, I would pay in gold bars to see a video like that of the periods which I have studied, to see evidence of micro-level social reactions to events but today's participants can see them for free. Sorry, I'm going crazy. Today's participants can see this stuff in real time, for free, within a few hours. In other words, they can see the kind of history they are making. The feedback loop is very, very swift. They can make fine judgments in second. They can short circuit the loops controlled by the powerful. Now, people ask, does this really change anything? And it is a good question, because as I say, so much uh, in each situation is overlaid by the old, the hierarchical. In Egypt, there's still the army, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafists, the organized left. In the USA, despite Occupied Wall Street, there's still Congress, the CIA, the cops, the Tea Party, the tasers, the dogs, all the various laws. The old is still there. But my answer is this. What does it change? Give Frodo Baggins a mobile phone, and the story of Lord of the Rings becomes a heck of a lot shorter. <laughs> Indeed, give Twitter to any character in Jane Austen, give Richard III a broadband connection and an iPad, and the story changes. Either it gets very, very over very, very quickly, or it's not the same story. Um, and as a mental exercise, I think that is a good way of thinking about the history we're going through. I think what it changes is this. Networks allow people, when it comes to protest, we know what it changes about dating. We know what it changes about um, music. Okay? What does it change about protest? It allows you to assemble individuals with limited commitment, protest against the target, then break up. They lower the whole overhead cost in terms of commitment to make a protest, and it... it and then, during the protests, hierarchies of opposition are much less necessary. Then, once you are free of hierarchies and you are empowered by real-time comms, you uh, become much more fluid. The forms of a guerrilla movement or a Leninist party or an urban riot don't change much over 100 years. But once you get social media or comms technology, they begin to constantly change in the process of happening. In Iran, the activists had a name for this. They called it wave creation. So that for every action, action they mobilized for using media, social media, they then learned from it and changed the action next time. To be part of any organizing network now, you also have to conform to the, in the West, and not only in the West sometimes, in the developed world, not only in the developed world, to the, to the norms of this to the norms of horizontalism, of collective decision making, of the assemb general assemblies, of this if you want to interrupt, that if you don't agree, all that stuff, okay, alien to my generation at college, very obvious when some of you maybe sat in and occupied your colleges. You have to do that. You have to go to the back of the queue if you're a white male you in the general assemblies. You have to go with the consensus forms of decision making. This is what the form of protest imposes on you, certainly in the developed world. Doesn't if you're a trade union activist, doesn't if you're a you know a, in a hierarchical movement, but if you're using these types of organization to their full, it does. And what it certainly does in the developing world is that de is there's now a culture of non-violence and a very, when I say a culture of non-violence, I mean a culture of study of non-violent techniques that because there is a very 
uh, heavily armed uh, intellectually um, academia about nonviolence, you can then draw on uh, in, in a way that is almost like ready-made. We know that the Egyptian revolutionaries didn't en masse study Gene Sharp. We know that Gene Sharp had an influence basically because Otpor in Serbia did study Gene Sharp and Otpor in Serbia did teach some of the more moderate Arab revolutionaries some of their techniques. That's going on. Um, no. This has had an impact, a bit like asymmetric warfare. The military in the early 2000s studied asymmetric warfare. They discovered asymmetric warfare existed. It was a challenge. Famously, I write about it in the book. You can look it up. Millennium Challenge 2002, a US uh, naval exercise which modeled a war against an opposing force in the Persian Gulf. Okay, so they put this guy, um, General Carl uh, von Riper, um, an uh, aging general, he's playing Iran. And the US Navy goes into the uh, exercise. It's half real, half paper, half, you know, half you know, on computers, half real. So they put ships around and they sail them around. Von Riper wins. By, uh, he, he, he broadcasts, he refuses to use el electronic comms at all. He broadcasts messages from mosques. He flies biplanes into aircraft carriers. He puts um, pleasure boats with Exocet missiles. He does all kinds of things that the, that the exercise allows him to do, and he fires everything at one target. And uh, about a day into the exercise, the Americans stop the exercise and say, this is not going how we expected. We're going to restart it and change the rules. And he <laughs> it's true. And Von Riper resigns. He says, you just don't understand the modern world. Now, <laughs> 10 years of learning... The, the military now understand a lot more about asymmetric warfare, um, both sides, okay, uh, in, that, in the Gulf region. And what do you do to fight it? You set up your own asymmetry. Um, one man's guerrilla group is another man's death squad. One man's uh, social media is another man's listening post, okay? You can do that, military, you can do that. But in democracies, it's quite hard to fight this low-level social asymmetric warfare without undermining democracy. Because what you have to do is you have to arrest thousands of people, basically charge them with thought crime. You have to, uh, you have to close down networks which are vital for business, uh, as Mubarak found. And ultimately, you do constrain democracy. I think we don't know where that's going. We don't know where the, the battle between the socially networked individuals and their groups and their forms of activism and increasingly repressive forms of state against them is going to end. I don't say it's a one-way street. I say it's harder for repressive states to operate. The, 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 the response of the Iranians, of course, was to use Facebook to chase down jail murder activists. It was also to set up the, to tell the besieged militia, these guys up here, to set up 10,000 blogs all praising you know, the regime. Um, I don't know how successful that's been. Uh, I suspect not that successful. Here's the third thing. I think there's probably even more interesting stuff going on at a level of individual behavior and even the self. Um, it was Manuel Castells who first tried to study um, what we call the networked individual, concluding from a study of internet unit users in Catalonia in the 90s. This, the more, individual, the more an individual has a project of autonomy, personal, professional, social, political, or communicative, the more she uses the internet. And in a time sequence, the more he, she uses the internet, the more autonomous she becomes vis-a-vis -vis societal rules and institutions. That's Castell's uh, use is that he has attempted to do quantitative research on internet behavior. For those of us who have tried to report on it, it's been quite hard to track down re reliable research. And Castells, I think, is one of the people who I'm interested in, um, uh, in, in, in those findings. So we know what. What does that tell us? That, that maybe new kinds of, of self-reinforcing behavior are going on because of the internet. The, the networked individual, what are their characteristics? Well, there are some of the characteristics laid out. But I've also been interested in the early psychologists and what I call pop sociologists of the internet, and forgive me for this in a sociology-based lecture, because there's, I haven't been able to find a lot of verifiable official sociology 
that, that helps. But one of the writers is Sherry Turkle, who's a psychoanalyst. She, she suggested, and I should say, therefore, that's why a lot of the writing is speculative and sometimes metaphysical, because, because that's the only tool we have, absent some of the evidence. Um, Turkle uh, suggested that the online world allows the creation of what she calls a decentered self, multiple selves living contradictory and parallel lifestyles. This is all based on study of people who were early internet gamers. Okay? The science writer Margaret Wertheim rejected Turkle's uh, proposal, suggesting it said in a book called The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace that Cyberspace, quotes, encourages a more fluid and expansive vision of the one self and that the self becomes, and I think this is a very useful concept for me, observing the behavior of people in social media. Well, the self becomes, she says, almost like a fluid leaking out around us all the time and joining each of us into a vast ocean or web of relationships with other leaky selves. If that all sounds a bit metaphysical, that is exactly what she intended it to be, although she qualifies it by saying all the internet is there doing is making obvious something that is unconsciously going on in pre-internet behaviour. We don't know whether any of them are right or wrong. Castells, Turkle, Wertheim, Clay Shirky, another big theorist of the internet, because we have very little to test it against. But I think it's far more useful to me, because I believe something big is changing, to be able to speculate about it than to simply go along and keep saying nothing is changing. Because I think it is clearly the case that the following is changing. These attributes studied by these early internet theorists were small groups, small geeky groups of gamers, daters, uh, you know, multiple personality people, stalkers. Okay? <laughs> Stalking online is a big thing. It seems now to us like prehistory because a lot of the behaviours described in these early papers on the sociology of the net are now manifest among tens of thousands of people because social media brings the ability to do all this stuff, multiple self, shamanism, you know, uh, on, you know having a false identity, um, multiple personalities to millions of people. Um, and it affects how, thing, how rioters move through streets. It affects how mass movements take rapid decisions while resisting hierarchy. I think it is affecting human behaviour and consciousness. The only thing I can say is I don't know how. We're going forward a bit to the question of where does it end. The only true answer is I don't know. But it seems pretty clear to me that the experience of the boom, the financial bust, sovereign debt crisis, and in some countries no slump, have fil finished off people's tolerance of a system where a rich elite simply gets richer while the middle class disappears into the, into the poor. Okay? I think that is pretty much one of the things that you could say tie together uh, people's experience in Egypt and people's experience in Occupy Wall Street. That's the extent to which I say they're part of the same thing. Obviously, there are very important national and specific things about Egypt, about Syria. I don't mean it in any way to attempt to say they are all the same. But we are at a moment. For Western capitalism, the question is, do you want to go along with the narrative of play by the rules, work hard, study, be entrepreneurial, and your life gets better, both over time for you and for future generations? If you do, I think... Western capitalism is probably going to have to say more than, uh, you know, to, to sort of be in a kind of John Le Mazuria style way in Dad's army to, to China. Would you please stop gaming the international system, if you'd be so kind, and uh, <laughs> impoverishing us? Because that approach hasn't worked so far. In this crisis, China, Germany have maintained their stability. The producing countries have maintained it. And I think we are going to end up in, a, in, in uh, there's been a lot of goodwill towards the developing world and among the emerging world and the emerging markets. But if, it, if the populations of the advanced world see this carrying on for years and years, then at some point it might occur to them that it is not the 1.3 billion Chinese people alone who are being dragged out of poverty, albeit in a sometimes brutal and haphazard way, but above all, a tiny elite at the top of Chinese society who are now richer than us, who have gamed the system. And what will happen is that politics will turn, as it turned in the 1930s, quite anti. It will turn quite anti-globalist. Um, you will end up saying, look, 
change the system, change the world division of labor. Now, there are some inside the, uh, the current business elite who see that moment coming and think it would be a bad thing okay, for the, a new protectionism and a new economic nationalism. But if you listen to their, uh, their alternative to it, they're equally problematic. Uh, Tijan Tiam, who's the, uh, the global CEO of Prudential, was at Davos last week. He gave an interview where he said, the answer is we need growth in Europe. Okay, I could go along with that. Then he said, what we need is to abolish the minimum wage across Europe. And in fact, the unions are the biggest problem. They represent the workers against the young. And for the youth to get jobs, we abolish the minimum wage so the youth can then work at globally competitive rates of pay. Now, that's a, that's a solution. That is a solution. It's, it's what lies behind a lot of the conservative rights attacks on Cameron and Osborne last week. Uh, that is a logical thing to do if you don't want to go down the route of protectionism. But I would imagine many of the people who are in that European summit tonight believe it to be suicidal. Okay, where's it ending up? It was Theodore Weil, the boss of Bell Telecom, who d first described the network effect that if one person uses the telephone and another does, then it creates a network externality, which is actually a third thing. That you know, The more people use this, the more valuable it is to them. And me, Theodore Weil, sitting at the boss of, in the HQ of, of Bell, I get something extra. I get a third thing in the shape of profit, more users, greater market share. So the, next, the network effect was, 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 was rationalized very early. We've been discuss discussing discovering its impacts on social activism later. It was in 1990 that the economist Paul Romer wrote his celebrated paper, Endogenous Technological Change, proposing that our economy consists not of capital, labor, and land, but of people, things, and ideas, and that the ideas bit, always seen as external to as a source of economic growth, was in fact central, or as he called it, endogenous. The market was becoming useless for pricing certain information-based goods. Given the economies of scale, Roma said the correct market price for some information-based goods, he, would, he liked to use um, rehydration sachets that help save millions of lives in the developing world, but they're only sugar and salt and water and therefore virtually worthless. Roma liked to suggest that the market value of rehydration fluid should be zero. Um, and that there was no possibility of assigning property rights to certain informa information-based commodities. Now, that was an interesting uh, insight into economics. In economics hasn't got its head around Roma's theory properly, I don't think. It's still contested. But you have the network effect. You have the proposal that info-capitalism creates new dynamics of value and price, which lead, in some cases, to non-value and non-price and non-property. And then independently, social theorists come to the same conclusion. People like Stuart Brand, the internet pioneer, go from, they quit, as they say, quit drugs for software, and they pioneer the open source movement. So they purposely create um, kinds of property that are not ownable by, by individual. Um, I think these are signs to us that, that some of the stuff that's happening um, might be epoch-making, might be an epoch-making change. Because why? This that I've got up here is a diagram that I got for a school website of the feudal system. Okay. Um, in 1345, when Edward III went bust, society's goods were allocated through this. Uh, this was the economic mechanism, tithes, vassalage, those of you who study this, you know, a, a system of land ownership, labor donation, up and down the, uh, the scale. That's the system. Where are the Bardi and Peruzzi families? Where are the bankers? They're not in the system. That's, of course, a crude school at GCSE level explanation of feudalism. Those of you who study it in detail will know that bankers played a very important role in the feudal system, but were not either central nor legally admitted to exist by it. They were the ghost in the machine. They, the, the future, the future system officially didn't exist. I simply want to end by proposing that with the uh, onset of networked technology, with 
the beginnings of a debate in mainstream economics about whether or not we're seeing valueless, priceless, propertyless forms of economic life. And with, of course, this amazing upsurge in idealism and the ability to see the future as a series of human rather than simply transaction-based uh, values, we might be, we might be um, at, at, at a moment where you have to say, are we in the beginning of a transition to something much bigger than just another form of the market economy? It's a, it's a very interesting question. I don't simply pose it because I don't find many people do pose it. Meanwhile, on the, on the streets, what does it come down to? I'll, I'll tell you what I think does unite. My experiences in, um, you know, in Egypt, in Here's Nigeria, where I haven't been for several years, but there's, there's the Nigerian youth last week uh, pointing the fact that it's a corrupt society. There's Russia um, in last month. Here's Manila, uh, slum dwellers uh, fighting against uh, forced clearances of slums. I'll tell you what I think is going on. Orwell, in his pro process of moving away from leftism, away from uh, you know, left politics, towards the positions he was to take in Animal Farm and in 1984. So this is not a left-right thing. Orwell wrote a, a very interesting essay about the Spanish Civil War, which was about an Italian soldier that he'd met in the barracks in Barcelona. And he said, look, the, he's dead, the guy, he's dead, he was a leftist, he's clearly gone. But it, Orwell said, the question for the future is just very simple. Shall people like that Italian soldier, who's a peasant, poor guy, shall people like that Italian soldier be allowed to live the decent, fully human life which is now technically available, or shan't they? I want it to be sooner, says Orwell, and not later. Sometime within the next 100 years, say, and not sometime within the next 10,000 years. All that is really happening, I think, from the slums of Cairo to the campuses of uh, Iran to the cities of Nigeria and the unemployed youth of Europe is people are saying, actually, never mind 100 years, what about in the next 10? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions from the audience, please? Yes. Um, okay. Paul, thank you very much. Very, thank you, very interesting and far too broad a canvas to respond to in a question. But just one small point. It's the distinction between revolt and resistance on the one hand and revolution and transformation on the other. That the social media is very effective for mobilizing resistance, as we've seen on the streets and squares of both the first and the third world. But if we look at Egypt, we find that the future belongs to the old media organizations, the Muslim Brotherhood, depends on face-to-face -face communications, because you can't build a program in 140 characters. Anybody else? Hi, Toby Chambers. Uh, we are in the crossroads right at this point in time. Um, you know, we had back in 2008 the rally cries of we're going to do all it takes, and you know, we've had. So, current rally cries of we're going to do all that it takes. Uh, the policies back in 2008 really weren't, you know, haven't actually done anything to, to actually solve the deep problems. Um, the really deep problems, are we going to actually allow Greece to exit the euro and, and actually for the system to sort of cleanse itself, or are we going to look, sort of keep stumbling along really? Um, you know, are the decisive decisions going to be made? And, um, you know, if, is it time we start to sort of face up to that reality? Well, 
why don't, yeah, why don't I just take one more and then we'll, we'll okay, I'll Okay, if your hand's higher than here. anybody else's. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm from Northern Ireland where we know about policing and I wondered if you had any remarks on the police response to uh, campers at St Paul's or elsewhere, I'm oh, sorry, uh, and perhaps factoring in the, the ban on camps in Parliament Square and the like, or even Dale Farm. Um, okay, let me, let me just come back on revolt versus revolution. And you're absolutely right to say the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uses the old methods. I think it's also fair to say that the, the, the Brotherhood um, you know, was very heavily repressed under Mubarak, um, but also encouraged to exist because they needed it. Uh, most of the accounts uh, do, do say this. I've interviewed uh, leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, their HQ has a man going around with a Mr. Sheen polishing uh, the leaves of, um, of, uh, of, of pot plants. And when I saw this man on his knees polishing the leaves of a pot plant, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, obviously I don't buy all the kind of crazy, you know, rhetoric about you know, Muslim Brotherhood and Islamism and fear, but it was quite reassuring to see this man with his pot plant. Um, they're just a, you know, I, I've seen the HQ of Christian Democratic parties in Europe and they're not that different, okay? Uh, the, no, no, of course, the Brotherhood were heavily repressed. People who you know, were not that radical were treated as terrorists. They have a huge following. The surprise has been Salafism uh, in, in, uh, in both Egypt and, to an extent, t Tunisia. And I think we will find, uh, were there ever to be more political freedom in Gaza, you will find Salafism also quite strong. Um, I think uh, the challenge for us as people who study and report on these things is to understand uh, that uh, as much as it is so that. However, all right, the difference between revolt and revolution. I think, obviously, you can fit the events into Egypt, into the classical phases. Those of you who study history, it, it does look a lot like 1848. I write about 1848 in the book. You know, 1848, you get the urban masses make the revolution in, in, in France. Uh, they, they force the convocation of a democratic assembly, but, but, the, but everybody, because it's universal suffrage, votes, and there's a huge rump of uh, reactionary uh, conservative peasant religious uh, voters and they put into place a reactionary assembly uh, which clashes immediately with working Paris so the first ever you know the first massacre four months later is is of workers by Cavagnac by, by the, the guy put in charge of order I mean it doesn't take a genius to see some of these patterns emerging in in Egypt um, in the future but what do we have? Highly educated uh, young workforce. Highly educated. Uh, all right, lots of illiterate people, but, but also highly educated people. And uh, again, one of the bloggers I write about in the book, a video blogger called Sarah Abdel Rahman, who, who blogs as Sarah's World, she said to me, look, they, you, you think, okay, the illiterates are here and there's the, there's the, the, the elite. But a guy comes running up to me and says, you are the video blogger. And she said, how do you know? Because you know, cause she, she's thinking, you're probably illiterate. He said, yeah, but people send these things on their Bluetooth to my phone and I've heard you. So don't assume that, there are no, that, there, that these are hermetically sealed worlds anymore, the urban poor, the, the intellectual elite. So, where does it, well, so, so yes, Egypt demonstrates some of the dynamics of an 1848-style revolution and reaction period. But what I'm, I am equally interested in as you know, as I say, a kind of amateur social historian, is the way in which, of course, there's been in the 20th century and 21st century a bit of a revolution in what social history can contribute to the understanding of revolutionary periods. So, in, there's a little couple of pages in the book where I went back and looked at some of the early attempts to do social history about 1848. Karl Marx would have known nothing of any of this apart from his actual experience on, in the, you know, student bars of you know Cologne or whatever uh, but but Leo Lubert who's an early social historian in the 1950s wrote a s social history of the Languedoc during 1848 which it becomes clear it's just a bit like Syntagma Square it's just one long party and debate or involving what they call tapage nocturne uh, nightly troublemaking and merrymaking and, and I think we, in other words, we mustn't allow our, those of us who have studied in the 20th century, the sort of hierarchical, the class by class, event by event version of revolution, 
mustn't underestimate the extent to which actual revolutions in history had this chaotic social character. On your question, I don't want to make this into a big meeting about, can, about Greece and the Euro. I think all I will say is I think the, 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 we are seeing the most unbelievable levels of uh, stasis and, and, and paralysis among an, a political elite that cannot get its head around the situation. That's the problem. Uh, that try as they might, um, they w person after person will come into the Newsnight studio and say the euro cannot be collapse because, because the price of its collapse is too great. They can never allow it to do so. And I've written before, I, I, when I hear that, and one reads accounts of pre-1914 <coughs> Europe, I'm not saying there's going to be World War III, but I do think, I do think that pre-1914 Europe talked itself into catastrophe by believing catastrophe was impossible. Sim all the accounts suggest this. I, I say in the in the book, you know, famously, you know, Stefan Zweig is in Ostend with a couple of with uh, Emil Behar and, and a couple of, Aust of uh, artists, and they go, "What's all this marching about for?" And the soldier says, "Because there's a war starting." He says, "Ridiculous! You know, don't be stupid, man." They get back on the train and passing them on the opposite track are the German troop trains. They just couldn't believe it. And I think the uh, the problem is that we. One wants a slight more resilience in the political elite to actually start. This is why I do sometimes throw into the faces of audience speculative ideas because I think if we, more speculative ideas have been put into the sort of minds of some of our decision makers at an earlier age, they wouldn't be so tram line think, thinking now. And you know, I'll go back to Keynes. I always like to quote Keynes, but Keynes, those of you who are critics of Lagarde and, and Merkel, Keynes used to keep saying, Don't wish for the failure of the stratagems of your political sort of enemies because you will not like what happens if the failure happens. Mm. Um, that's what I keep saying about Europe. I hope it succeeds. Um, the third question was, and I, where, where was it? it? The police. I, oh, God, I mean, the, the specific, I think this does pour, the situation poses a very interesting challenge for, for law, law enforcement professionals and theorists. You'll know that uh, Policy Exchange had this, um, had this, uh, had this seminar not long after the student riot saying, uh, are we doomed to now see uncontrollable social and civil disorder which no forms of policing can cope with? To which my answer is not, you know, not yes, absolutely, but yes, you better get used to whole new forms of, because as, as fast as you develop mechanisms to deal with it, you're going to be actually confronted with changes. We saw, we're seeing weird things in, in law enforcement. We're seeing in America some quite worrying, you know, we, of course America's had 20 years in which everybody who is the subject of law enforcement is the other. You will be aware of the concept of the other. You know, so the whole, I, I mean, I, I've had this happen to me reporting the, the G20 summit in Pittsburgh because we were filming a, 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 a steel worker on the edge of a steel works. The steel works in America decided that the steel works wasn't allowed to be filmed. Um, so they called the police. And the, the amount of force the police deployed to try and stop us filming it. A, a perfectly innocent guy outside a perfectly innocent place it was unbelievable. And, and we hadn't done anything wrong, and we had our press passes. So that's what, in America, I think there's a big issue going to happen there. Uh, let's hope it doesn't happen. Here, I think it's quite interesting. The Met, the Met are struggling at the moment with how to deal with protest. They had that big barrier, so they brought their big barrier out, which is, was designed to channel people in the case of a nuclear biological attack. So they did that. I think I, I, if I were, I'm not, I, but I were, if I were in the kind of law enforcement study area, I think it'd be a fascinating thing to actually. What we go on courses at the BBC to to be in riots, so to report in riots, you go into them, and we're often taught by cops and ex-cops. And at one point, they were saying, um, you know, one of the things is find out some intelligence about the people you, who are going to be there. Do you? homework, find out who the different people are, how would you do this and the, the cops are saying, testing us how would you find out this intelligence, and I said phone them up uh, uh, it might be just helpful if you just phone them up occasionally, uh, they are phoneable, some of them are here even in this audience um, carry on, answering questions, asking questions ah, ok um, can someone towards the back please um, the Third row from the back, person with glasses. Yes, please. Hi. Um, you spoke about one of the possible reactions being 
uh, to all of this being quite nationalistic. Um, and I was, that just made me think of the reaction of uh, Germany and to what's happening in Greece, which seems very nationalistic in the sense of why should we pay for them? And what I was wondering is this idea of the kind of networked self and the links between this sort of new sociological type, do you think that is powerful enough to overcome a sort of populist, uh, to a certain extent, anti-immigration uh, sentiment of why should we pay for them, why should we support them? Let me come straight back on that and try and be briefer in my answers, if I may. Right, okay, I think in the book, what I've written about is this. It, it's quite annoying, I think, for leftists, uh, this bit of it. Okay, I, I think the, the source of a lot of nationalism and, and sort of you know, racism is the, the impact of, it's the non-exposure to globalised work and the, and the exposure to negative impacts of globalisation. So if you look at Mecklenburg, if you look at parts of East Germany, uh, you look at, you look at uh, far right in northern Europe. It, it, it's, its main source of support is from workers, workers, okay? Not as in Nazi Germany, the petty bourgeoisie. It is workers whose lives are being ruined by globalization and they perceive the, the negative impact on wages of migration. But equally well, the, the workforce, even if you define it very narrowly, the proletariat, the, you know, the waged, even manual, workforce is equally, there's a part of it that is exposed to globalised work, will work for, say, a, group, a, a company like G4S, which has a global agreement with unions, which has, you know, maybe not the unions don't love their policy on things like um, equality and, uh, and e HR, you know, e equal opportunities and gender, you know, specific policies, but they do have policy. And so you, what I think is a very interesting moment now in the developed world are workforces who are completely exposed to what you might call socially liberal work and others who are excluded from it. That, I think, predicts the, not the outcome, but the starting point of all these things. Now, I, what, I, Germany, do I see German nationalism as the main problem? No, I absolutely do not. I think the German, there is this, this Bild and the Spiegel and there's all kinds of things going on in the German press. But I think um, Germany and the, all the, the surplus countries, China and you know, Japan included, are sitting there going, what have we done wrong? You know, we're the, we're, all we've done is kept the economy going, spent, you know, produced. Ha even in Germany and Japan, we've got this resilient social system that is not collapsing, that is keeping social order in the face of all these skinheads and whatever. You, we, what, what are we supposed to have done wrong? Okay. I think it's, it, it, is, it is, you know, they get a lot of stick. Of course, what, the, what, what has gone wrong is the system during which, you know, they have maintained the resilience while all the countries who, it, where, where there was inbuilt, you know, weakness to the model are collapsing. Um, so that's my answer to you. That's as far as I can get without dominating the entire thing. Good answer. Okay, you, you've been catching my eye, so... <laughs> Thank you for our lecture. I've got a quick question. Uh, in your view, uh, maybe not whether, but when it will kick off in Europe and people, not the EU commissars, will be able to change regimes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, do, you want, do, you want, do you want another? Yeah, the, the, the second, uh, yeah, the guy with the, I think it's pink shirt. I'm just wondering. Yeah, very similar to the last gentleman. Um, what do you think is going to be the impact this summer of um, the proposed, especially given that Greece and Italy don't have democratic governments at the moment, given that um, with all this high unemployment and austerity, they want to put through this fiscal union thing? When are people in Europe actually going to notice that there's an undemocratic way of deciding the taxes that they're going to have to pay when they don't have any jobs and they don't have any money? And surely that was going to kick off at some point like this summer. I, I, let, let me just answer those two things because I think that I, I think society has just become very unpredictable in some of the crisis countries. Um, what, what do we know? What, what, what's our model? Hungary. Okay, Hungary had was the first one into downturn, and it was the first one that had uh, saw some of the what you might call collapse of legitimacy. So they had a social democratic government, which was accused and some people believed proven to have been corrupt, vote rigged. Uh, shot people, uh, you know, on the street. This is what the, the, its, its opponents then said. Okay, so Hungary 
kind of tried to play by the international rules and, be, and its government fell, so there was a one-year technocratic government. I've interviewed some of the members of that government. And what they said is, look, then we did what the IMF told us. It wasn't so severe as what's going to happen to Greece and Portugal. We did what the IMF told us, and we did conform to the rules. And we could do it because we were technocratic, non-elected. And we knew we had no political careers, so we've, we've, we've ruined ourselves personally as well. Um, and then Viktor Orban uh, comes along and says, look, right, Orban's motivation is that to finish off the remnants of the communist system, of the Hungarian Stalinist system. That's what his motivation is. He sees the constitutional, uh, and he, weirdly, he sees the, the, the influence of some neoliberal players as a remnant of the unfinished revolution against, against communism in Hungary. And therefore, he says, I'm going to finish it constitutionally, economically, right. Technocratic government didn't work. Stand for election. Election, two-thirds majority. Um, with a two-thirds majority, he then changes the constitution. Um, he, his critics would say, seizes the national pension system and nationalizes a, pr a previously private pension system, thereby many people, well, there's, I think there's thousands of cases being taken against the Hungarian government in the European Court of, I think it's human rights, not justice. Um, so, okay, so you've got nationalist government, Jobbik, the far-right party, 24% in the polls, because he's now in trouble. And so one, you know, what, what the guy said to me, the former finance minister, he said, look, the problem is, you, techn technocratic government can work, but watch out for what comes after, because people can swing quite rapidly when they believe all other hope has gone towards these, you know, in, 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 in Orban's case, simply a form of more nationalist conservatism, and in Jobbik's case, opposition party with an overt racist policy on, on gypsies uh, and, and has played in the past with outright anti-Semitism. Uh, they just say, we're the anti-globalizers. Um, that is what I think the danger is, but I don't think Greece or Portugal are anywhere near as far down the root of that because come what may, you know, the, the, the problem is with places like Hungary, the, the extreme sort of non-resilience of institutions, the youngness uh, of, of institutions, and the, what's happened in the political culture of that country under the repressive regimes of Stalinism has made them, the people very, find it very difficult to cope with this situation. I think the, the, the Portuguese and the Greeks and the Irish, the Irish above all, seem to be coping a lot better with the, with the, with the, the vagaries of, uh, of austerity. So I, I, do I predict he'll be kicking off this summer anywhere? I don't necessarily know because I think, as I've reported from Greece and as those of you who've seen my stuff will know, I think there is a phase in the crisis mm. that beyond the Syntagma riots where people go into their own huddle and they begin to do what's called anomic uh, resistance. So they, you know, they chop down trees or they, they give their car number plate back and say, I don't want a car because if it's going to cost me, take my car, take the number plate. And I think a lot of Greek people are in that mood but, you know, I would say, and I'd say this to policymakers when I speak to them, is that, you know, you do have to come down and see this. You're, you know, you, when I was in Greece, talking to, to politicians, do an interview, we've only got 10 minutes, would you mind coming into the sunlight so we don't have to set up our lights? Ooh, no, sorry, I can't be seen on the street, okay? I can't be seen on, I'm just an opposition politician, I can't be seen in public. Okay, that means you can't talk to about a third of the population. And I do think the journalists not just me, but my, my fellow journalists, do have a role here in saying this is reality to those in power. You have to, because how, how do they find out? How do they find out what's, what's really going on? It's actually, if you're a professional politician, in these situations, quite hard to find it out. Okay, yes, you please, middle, just, yeah. Um, thank you for the lecture. I'm from Kenya and one thing I've, I found very interesting is when you're trying to compare the Arab Spring with uh, Wall Street, just finding out the comparisons. And um, what I personally thought in the Middle Eastern countries, there wasn't democratic space. They couldn't move into political parties to bring yeah. up change. And what I've seen in my own country, Kenya, is that people have tended to move into the streets so fast 
and they don't co explore political parties. The youth are not really very active in political parties. And when you're on the streets and you're not voting, you, you're not where it matters. Mm. Mm. And in the West, I'd tend to think that there is democratic space. And how many people focus on changing policies of political parties? You can be out on the streets all day, but what people fear is take over the political parties, mm. take over the things that change. Because if you don't, you'll shout, they'll calm you mm. down. Three months down the line, they'll bring in the same yeah. legislature they wanted to. Yeah. They stopped. So that's my view. What do you think, think about that? I think that? you make a very valid point there. And I do have some experience of, of both reporting uh, on the, on the uh, post-election violence that, that took place in Kenya, and of before that, reporting with uh, the Nairobi People's Settlement Movement. Uh, where people had tried to use horizontal methods to link up the different shanty towns and slums in, around Nairobi. But I think the point you make here is that, okay, if you don't want to be in the game of professional politics, then whatever you do on the streets, ultimately it's reform by riot. A guy in a hoodie goes to prison so that a guy in a suit can get their policies passed. Okay. This is well known and it's not new to the information age. The interesting thing is that I've observed, say, in Egypt, when you've seen very educated youth, youth whose maybe sometimes fathers have been professional opposition politicians, even these youth are now so turned off the methods of even liberal democracy that they don't want to do liberal democracy, even though they're in the midst of a collapsing dictatorship. They'll often, because what do they know? They know that their dad, albeit good guy as he is, committed as a d d democracy, been to jail, okay, when he has to go to the village and do liberal democratic politics, it still involves putting his hand into a huge sack of money and giving it to people, okay, because that's what politics is in many parts of the developing world. And I sense among this generation of educated youth in Egypt that what, what disoriented them was that just, I don't want to be a party politician. I'd rather be a DJ and a social media activist. Of course, there are far left parties, there are activists in social democracy and liberalism who don't do what I've just said. But I think I have observed people doing, as you, know, as you say, dislocating themselves from that, from that. I think this is one of the big challenges for this generation, and it's one of the big challenges in the next few years, because um, to the extent that the youth involved in horizontal networks do not want to articulate against party politics, they will, actually their outcomes will be not too much dissimilar to, to the outcomes in, in, in political spaces that are quite dominated by party politics as Kenya and is. I don't know what, if we had longer we could talk about some of the lessons of the Orange Democratic Movement because I think that may be one of the precursors. It did use some of the social media, it did use some, you'll know Celtel and uh, Safaricom are, you know, how people communicate. Uh, among on the streets and it did use some of that but look we haven't got time for that but I think am I answering your question here yes. good well let, let's have another one then yes you please sorry this money uh, yeah Um, thank you for the lecture. You know, the VES uh, seems to support. Um, sorry, is the yeah okay. Now the VES seems to support the Arab, the Arab uprisings at the moment uh, because they say it's consistent with the values of democracy. Now, the concept of democracy in the Arab world is not so clear as it is in the West at the moment because they're always related to religion. They tend to relate it more to religion. Now, what does that mean uh, for the future world? Are we leaving it, um, a world, a, a more of a bipolar world for our generation where there would be another clash between ideologies and because one ideology would always tend to prevail because... Which ideologies do you mean in that bipolar world? Um, because Western democracy is a product of secular ideology. And uh, in the Arab world, um, that might not necessarily be the case because democracy could actually end up taking the back seat and religion could actually start dictating. If, uh, you know, de if democracy means uh, what the people want, then in the Arab world, that might mean that they want religion to be sitting in the legislature making decisions. Mm -hmm. And that might actually mean that the Western democracies and uh, the Arab democracies might not actually you know, be as... Um, 
they would not be able to co coexist. Let, let, let me answer you with, with a, slightly op, a slightly tangential point, an observation. I think what you say is entirely a possibility that, that, that Tunisia, certainly Libya, possibly Egypt, go down the route of quite religi religiousized democracies and that, and that, and that the, the secular minority loses faith in it and just switches off. I've observed in developed world countries what are the impacts of the new technology. Of course, we've known about the dislocation of lots of people from politics for a long time. One of the impacts of technology, I think, has been that people, let, let me just put it like this, I think people realise that they, if they want to, they can create quite a little expanded space for their own uh, survival and activity in which they can take some decisions. I'm thinking about council estates or community organising. And because what's been on offer to them in democracy is quite a constrained choice between two forms of essentially neoliberal politics. It's true in Germany, but true in France probably up to now, certainly true in Britain, certainly true in Ireland. Um, they, okay, what do they do? They go, well, look, come on, how many times am I going to go through this? What, what is important to me is local, it is familial, it is communitarian, and I can, I can solve not all my problems, but I can solve such problems that are solvable at a local level. And I think that that's a dynamic. That, so instead of you seeing just an immediate bipolarity between the secular and the non-secular, you, you could see those who lose the, uh, those who lose the, uh, lose the power can always adopt this kind of living despite the system. Um, I think that's something that if I was a sociologist or a political scientist, I would study more. The, the extent to which these horizontal or community networks actually insulate your, your, you from the inability to change things at the ballot box. Now, I don't know whether that's an, a head-on answer to what you're saying, but I think it's the, the best thing I could share with you at that point. We've got time for one more? Yes, could we have one? Thank you. Because you, you were the first up, so... You, you warned us um, not to underestimate the ability of capitalism as a system to adapt uh, to the crises that it creates. Um, and yet we, you, you acknowledge that we have a political elite that seems incapable of, of responding effectively to it. So I wonder where you see at that adaptation coming from. Is it, is it, I mean, it also seems to me we have a financial elite or a, or a, a business elite that has a, a vested self-interest in not reforming corporate governance structures or the way... Uh, the, the current forms of operation that uh, capitalism has. So where do you see, the, where's the adaptation going to come from? What's it going to look like? Um, well, let's take the UK as an example. Um, in the Bank of England, you've got, um, you, you've certainly got, the institutions have had to change in order to manage the crisis. The Bank of England runs the economy. The Bank of England sets policy. Nobody knows what it's supposed to be uh, nor are we very clear what it, what it is, but it is suddenly an entity at, sitting at the heart of the economy. Sitting in the Financial Responsibility Office of the Bank of England is a guy called Andy Haldane. Look up his 2009 paper, Banking on the State, and you'll see probably the one of the most radical critiques of the current system of the relationship between banking and states. He calls in the paper for, a, for effectively a return to the Edward III situation, where states can drive banks out of business at the bank's expense to the survival of the state. I call that quite radical. I call that quite um, resilient thinking. Now, of course, he's now a regulator. He's the financial regulator as well. And is he about to do any of this radicalism? Probably not. But was Haldane and were voices like that influential? In See, when I, when I saw the Vickers report, the, in, the Com in, Independent Commission on Banking, I was quite surprised how much of it was accepted by Osborne. Because I thought, and in fact I was told by bankers, that they nobbled Vickers and there would be nothing radical at all. I think ra Vickers, though the radicalism is delayed, the final outcome is quite radical. It's a virtual Glass-Steagall. If you do it aggressively, it's quite a heavy reform. I think Haldane partly is responsible for that. So there's an example. Um, who else is thinking radically? Cameron makes a speech saying globalisation can destroy local creativity and entrepreneurship. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not turned suddenly overnight into Saul Alinsky, but, but, but I think we are seeing the beginnings of people re-questioning. 
Miliband, see Miliband gets drowned by the fact that he's in terrible trouble, uh, he's, he's not cutting through as a politician, he's got problems, but his actual ideas are changing the debate inside the Labour Party, quite possible, maybe a 40% chance they become the government. He, he's, he's kind of, I think there, you're seeing the beginnings of, of, of some changes in, 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 in ideas. Hollande in France, very interesting, not only because I mean, the French Socialist Party always comes up with all this kind of um, radical sounding rhetoric at elections, but the really interesting thing is that all, the, the, the base of the French Socialist Party has, and it's one of the few parties in the world that has managed to recruit a few members of the anti-globalisation and NGO movement as activists. So, so one of the, th I, what's not happening in Germany so much, what's not happening you know, in, in other places, is happening there. Um, I'll only say, shall I finish on this? Um, look, um, as a journalist, um, what you're doing is you're writing the first draft of history. You're always trying to do that. Um, and sometimes, what, in periods, there are periods in which it's very obvious what the paradigm of writing the history is. So if you're covering the miners' strike in 1984, or if you're covering the Second World War, or even if you're covering the Arab-Israeli conflict as a pure conflict, um, it, it, although one wants to think outside that box, it's not going to help you too much, or more than a 10% uh, gain in creativity. I think this thing that we're studying now, um, the more off-the-wall speculative metaphysical one can be, the more one is going to help oneself to understand what's going on. Because my book is simply the product of being, half the chapters are just pure reportage. This is what happened to me, this is what it's like. But the other half of it is by talking to activists, talking to social theorists, and trying to say, trying to get the answer, what is going on here? What is happening? Now it may be that I am wrong. It may be that actually we're seeing a very analog, a very arithmetical change that, in fact, we're just going through an 1848-style thing and that the mobile phones and the iPods are incidental and that what will actually shape it are simply the class and the economic, uh, the, maybe the gender relationships. Maybe that's it, the religion. That's it. So, so maybe, you know, the sort of foreign affairs magazine view of the world triumphs and, and, and I am wrong. If I am right, the problem is I don't know how right I am. I don't know how much morphing and changing is going on in social reality because I don't think that we've got enough models to understand it. But I just come back to looking at something like Syntagma Square, something like the uh, Indignado protests in Spain, and going to see people who are involved in that and asking yourself are these just the foot soldiers of another, you know, are, are these just like the foot sol soldiers of Od Odinga in, 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 in Kenya? Are these just powerless people? Uh, or are these just a mob? Um, it doesn't feel like it to me. It feels like what you're seeing is the beginning of a new kind of person, just as in the Edwardian era, if you watch any costume dramas, you will always see the liberated woman, the, liber the newly free young man, the, the, the worker who's educated. These are new types. Uh, new because I would ultimately I am a bit of a technological determinist because they have the motor car, the phonogram, the vaudeville, the early cinema. These are personal and individual enhancing technologies. We have now got that cubed. We've got, we've got it cubed and it's coming at faster at us than we can understand. I think it is changed. The in interesting thing for me is the changes in human behaviour. In a hundred years' time, or maybe 50, so everybody in the room can kind of, may maybe we've all got a hope of living another 50, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to look back and answer that question. Uh, I don't think we'll answer it in five years. But if, if I were a, so a young sociologist, I'd be very interested in trying to, whenever I bring up, I say, look, we want to do a thing about the internet. Who's done the quality, so who's done the quantitative research? Who can prove whether we're right or wrong? We, we, I kind of want to get my skates on, on that. Thank you. I think we're done. <laughs>